I have been reading quite a bit this summer in the book of Psalms um, and finding just so many deep truths that, you know, whenever you read scripture, sometimes you read the same thing you haven't read for a long time, but the second time you read it or the third time you read it, something else jumps out at you and something more powerful comes out or something deeper comes out. That's been my kind of journey right now in the Psalms as I've been reading through that this summer. And so I want us to consider together <clears throat> Psalm 37, 1 to 7 today. Psalm 37, 1 to 7. And we've titled the message, He Will Not Forsake His Saints. He Will Not Forsake His Saints. And maybe just for clarity, if you come from a, a Catholic background, we believe that saints are every believer in Christ. Everyone who is a believer in Christ is called a saint in the scriptures. We are made uh, holy by the sacrifice and death of Christ. So... There is a theme in many of the Psalms that I think we can relate to. It is one that David seemed to have on his heart often, and it was simply this. Why do the wicked prosper while the saints at times do not? Why do evil people find success in this world and so many of God's people suffer many hindrances? That was a theme, that is a theme that is repeated throughout the Psalms. David, as a king of Israel, was a man that was pressed on all sides. He had surrounding nations looking to conquer him by sword and the military. And more than that, he, wa he saw the enemy of ungodliness and wickedness from without and from within Israel. We do not have any idea, really, we really don't understand it typically, how wicked and terrible the false religions of Baal and Moloch were in his surrounding area. These demons that were a part of the surrounding nations were not just mere idols. We do not really realize the child sacrifice that occurred in these people groups, how they'd throw their babies into fires while still alive in order to call on their gods to help them have food and riches. This is what surrounded David on all sides. And David would look at the wicked and the things that they were doing and he would say, why God do they get to exist? Why, God, do they get to keep going and prosper and be called a nation? Why, God, does Baal and Molech even have any followers at all? Why do people follow that? David would at times likely have been outraged that the wicked are allowed to prosper and with that prosperity raise a spear against Israel and against God. Now, fast forward to today. Has anything changed has anything changed for you as a Christian? Do you look at the world around you and you look at the sexual agendas, the human trafficking, there's this great movie out right now about that, human trafficking, the drug culture, abortion, lying media, the presence of wicked men in places of power in your nation and find yourself wondering why God are they allowed to continue? Why does this stuff get, uh, be allowed to keep going? Why God is such rampant wickedness occurring and yet they still prosper, they still have followers, they still gain ground. I think about that when it comes to spiritual things as a pastor, wicked spiritual leaders and churches that teach false gospels and woo people with their cult by manipulation, by tickling ears, by displays of entertainment, by impressing the flesh and appealing to carnality whilst at the same time denying God's word. Why? Why, God, do those ministries have people that are it's just exploding? There's people filling up those churches. Why are they allowed to continue to take the name of Christ and use it for their own wicked prosperity? Why are they building and growing their churches and adding to their buildings? Or maybe you personally are in a place where in business you have seen the boss or the leader or a company cheat, steal, bully, cut corners, and through dishonest gain make their way to the top and make a pile of cash on the way, whilst you, working day to day just to keep en make ends meet, why do the wicked prosper, God? Why am I bursting, uh, busting my hump trying to do the right thing and am left in hardship while these wicked people gain each day? That might have been something that comes across you as a concern. This is a concern for David. This is my concern as well. I know it's a concern for many of you. And it may cause us to wonder if God's forsaken us. That was kind of uh, David's concern. God, where are you? Have you forsaken your people? Have you forsaken this world? Have you forsaken the saints and allowed the wicked to go too far? And we may be tempted in that place to be like, hey, God, you know, maybe you need some help. 
Maybe there's something we can do. Maybe if we just step in and start taking over some things, maybe all will be better. No, God doesn't need your help. He's not abandoned you. He has not forsaken his saints, nor has he turned a blind eye to the wicked who appear to be prospering in their wickedness. And as David is going to show us, there's a wise response to this dilemma that we see today. And by it, we're reminded that the love of God for his children is ever-present, and he does not forsake his saints. And so I want us to look at that together. So if you have your Bibles, I want to ask you to turn with me to Psalm 37, verses 1 to 7. Psalm 37, 1 to 7, so we can see the wisdom that David has for us regarding this problem of why do the wicked prosper while the saints struggle. Psalm 37, 1 to 7, and I think we'll have it up here as well. This is what David says. Fret not yourselves because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. So here David gives us clear wisdom on what to do when we see the wicked prosper. First, he says in verses 1 to 2, fret not. Fret not. That is the first thing. Fret not yourselves because of evildoers, he says. You know, the Hebrew word here for fret means to burn or to be kindled with anger. We typically go fret. Ah, don't fret about it. But here, it actually means to burn and be kindled with anger. Do you ever rant in your house? Any ranters here this morning? My wife and I are terrible ranters. When, I mean, we have a German and a Scottish background. We, we make up people in our home to yell at. We just make up this scenario to get angry but, and then rant at that. And so when we turn on the TV or we look at some of the things going on in the world, we find it's quite therapeutic to rant about it for a while. That, I can't believe they're doing that. Why would they do that? Don't they know what the truth is? Here's the truth, and that doesn't even make any reasonable sense, and boo, 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 and you just keep going. It's very therapeutic. But there comes a point where you realize you've gone too far. <laughs> I've gone too far in our kids. It's usually when our kids are like, yeah, mom and dad, we know. We know. And they look at us kind of rolling their eyes. Here they go again, sort of thing. We confess to you today that we are ranters. Now, it is fine to have righteous anger. It is fine to be bothered in spirit about wicked things that we are seeing. But we cannot let our anger consume us and cause, and cause us to go in the direction of unbridled passion. We are not to fret. Don't burn or be consumed by anger because of the evildoers. Don't let them destabilize you. Because there is a danger in that. There is a danger in letting anger uh, come over you and getting so angry over the wicked that it consumes you. We're not God. God gets angry in a righteous way and he can control and he knows exactly what to do with his anger. But we are sinners and the anger can easily become our master, moving us to do our own evil. In fact, that's what verse eight of this psalm says if you read on in the psalms. And I'll just say this, the rest of the psalm past verse seven continues to come back to the things we've already read in the first seven verses, just reinforcing it. So if you read on in verse eight of the Psalms, it says, refrain from anger, forsake wrath, fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. So there's the warning. It tends only towards evil. There's something to be said about letting the wrath of God have front seat. Leave room, brothers and sisters, for the Lord's vengeance. Do not take it upon yourself. We tend to fall into our own evil when we try. And I think the last few years have demonstrated that for us in a very real way. In our frustration, in our burning anger, we have done evil in our attempt to take things into our own hands. So God says to us, don't fret. Do not fret. You children of God, you saints of the Lord, do not fret on account of the evildoers. 
It also says here in verse 1, do not envy the wrongdoers. In other words, as you see them prospering, as you see them getting ahead, do not envy their prosperity. Do not be jealous of what they have because if you do, you end up coveting what they have. And coveting is a sin in itself, but you may also be tempted to do what is wicked in order to have what they have. You may desire to compromise in order to, pro- uh, to pro- uh, prosper and succeed like they are. Imagine a Christian who compromises his ethics in business or a church who preaches what is easy and popular and cool to be popular or the Christian's politician who will lie and play ball in order to keep power or the Christian actress or singer who compromises herself or himself, their body, their values in order to get famous. Do not on account of envy sell your soul. Do not envy what the wicked have. So David says our first response to the wicked that prosper is first of all to not fret. Do not fret and do not be envious of them. And here's why. Verse 2. For they will soon fade like grass and wither like the green herb. It gets even stronger in the rest of the psalm. Verse 15. Their swords will enter their own hearts and their bows will be broken. Verse 20. The wicked will perish. Verse 38 says, it, the strongest, but the transgressors shall be altogether destroyed. The future of the wicked will be cut off. And read cut off with as much emphasis as you can. Why should we not fret or envy? Because the wicked are going to have to face the judgment and wrath of Almighty God one day, and it will be terrible. They will be cut off meaning from this world and the world to come. In time, you will not have to see them anymore. God is going to act. We've always said it before, Christ right now saves us from the bondage of sin. But when we get to heaven, he's going to remove the presence of sin. Psalm 73, which is funny, um, because it's the exact reverse number of Psalm 37. So if you think about these pairings, Psalm 73, Psalm 37, David is speaking to this subject and he's saying things like this. This is what the wicked are like, he says, always carefree, amassing more and more wealth. And then he says, surely I've kept my heart pure in vain. It's like, surely I've done this whole thing of following God. It's all in vain. Why am I doing it? They're prospering. I'm suffering. What's going on? Surely my high standard of moral purity is for nothing. And then David says this in verse 17. This troubled me deeply until I entered the sanctuary and I understood their final destiny. I understood their end. Yeah, they have money. Yes, they have carefree as they just go about without a conscience about some of the things they're doing but they're going to perish in their sin. And in, they're going, and in this, they're going to be judged for a wicked life. God's going to cut them off. And all that power and money will be worthless. They will not enjoy eternity in glory. They will have eternity in hell. That's what David says. I went to the sanctuary and I saw their end. Why fret? Why envy? This is the reason we don't fret. This is the reason we don't envy the wicked. Their end is nothing at all to be envied. Their destiny is not one that you want. Christ has no place to lay his head. He was poor by all human standards. He was rich in mercy and grace, which is what we are striving to be. Do not fret. They will be judged. They will be cut off. One day God's people will not have to see them anymore. You can imagine David looking at these places, Baal, Moloch, why do they keep going? And God says, don't worry, they're going to be cut off. It's going to happen. And in some ways, this should move us to a bit of compassion. From a place of burning anger to gospel mission. Because on the one hand, we desire that they get their just desserts. But on the other hand... We, in the heart of Christ, would rather they turn to Christ, repent, and be made new. After all, you were once counted among them. Those of you who are in Christ, you were once counted among the wicked. So such were some of you doing these things, if not for the grace of Christ in you. And if he can save and change you, then he also can save and change them. So we champion, therefore, the gospel of Jesus Christ in this wicked day that we're in, 
And so first of all, friends, do not fret. The next time you turn on the news, the next time you read about something going on, the next time city council in Red Deer passes a crazy law, don't burn with anger. Do not fret. There's a reason that we can put ourselves in a place of not fretting. Second, delight yourself in the Lord. There's a nice addition here from King David. We see that we're not to fret or be envious of the wicked who prosper. So what should we be doing as we see the wicked prosper? We're told here in verses 3 to 6 that instead of fretting, we're to be in a place as God's people where we delight ourselves in the Lord. We delight ourselves in God. It starts in verse 3 saying to us, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. I love that. That stuck out to me. Befriend faithfulness. There's something important to note. It is that while the wicked do evil, the righteous in Christ are to be doing good. We are not to sit around fretting and angry all day, wondering why the world is the way it is, just ranting in our homes. We're to be good Christian soldiers, to go out there, bring the light into the darkness. We're to befriend faithfulness. That means we are to set faithfulness to God as our companion in life. That's what we're searching to be, is faithful. You know, whenever I find myself in a scenario where I do not know the outcome or feel that I cannot control the outcome, I try to ask myself one question. That's a question we should all ask ourselves in those moments. What does it look like to be faithful to God regardless of the outcome? Regardless of what's coming, regardless of how this looks like it's turning out, what does it look like to be faithful to God in that time? The wicked will do what the wicked do, but you, dear Christian, will you remain faithful? Faithful to the gospel, faithful to the truth, faithful to your role as a husband or a father or a wife and a mother. Will you be faithful to God even when the end appears to be a loss from all worldly perspective? Indeed, we're not, it, we are not to be in a place where we forsake that. We are to trust in the Lord and in His sovereign purpose. And while we trust in the Lord, we do what is good in the face of evil, and we do what is faithful in the face of rebellion. And then in verse 4, we're told this very famous verse, this verse that we all know. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. This is a very good reminder For the unsatisfied Christian who is fretting, who is looking and burning with anger, who is looking at the wicked prosper and wondering why why we cannot have what they have, success, carefree lives, the truth should be going forward. Why, Why can they prosper when they're not always walking in that? How are we to satisfy our deepest desires and longings? And it says, by delighting ourselves in the Lord. And this does not mean that if we delight ourselves in the Lord, he'll give us money and fame and success in all things. That's not what it says. It means that as we delight in the Lord, he will change our hearts to desire what his heart desires. And then in that place of coming into unity with his truth and heart, he satisfies our souls and gives us the desires of our heart, this new and godly heart. You know, David He went from desiring money, power, to wanting God, wanting truth, wanting faithfulness. And in God, he would find all those things. If you find yourself valuing your money and your success more than God and faithfulness, then pay attention. Don't be counted among the wicked. Make sure your priorities are straight. God is a greater prize than anything this world can give you. Paul said in Philippians 3, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we see the wicked prosper, we're to trust in the Lord. We're to do good. We're to be faithful. And we're to delight ourselves in God. There's here this picture of God's people. Supposed to be a picture of beauty of Christ in a broken world. 
that this community, this place even here this morning can be a beautiful place that represents Christ as we delight in the Lord together. And it's a a place where we want people to come in and see that, that we are delighting in him, that he is our greatest joy. We are to be the aroma of Christ, the Bible says. You can fret every day. You can complain of what we see. Or we can be busy delighting in our God. And delighting in our God will move us to action. It will cause us to live for Him. We will passionately pursue Him and His desires for our lives. What massively opposing words, fretting and delighting. Fretting and delighting are such massively opposing words. Shall we burn with anger or shall we shout to the Lord? The church can and should be a place not of fretting people, but of people who display the beauty of Christ by delighting in their God. What a massive change it is to go from fretting about the wicked to delighting in God. And as we do that, we're told in verse 6, he will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. So as the wicked do what is evil, there will be a moment in this life and in the end of days where your righteousness will come to light, a righteousness given to you by Christ. All those things that you were mocked for, hated for, despised for, for standing on God's word will be shown to be right in the end. These truths have standed the test of time already. These truths have already shown That for those societies that walk in them, it's healthy, it's good for them. And those societies that do not, it starts to break apart and fall, fall to pieces. In the end, they'll be shown to have done evil and having done wrong in the eyes of Almighty Judge of heaven and earth. And you will be lifted up as standing on the truth and on what is right and good. When the Lord returns, His saints will stand with Him. But even today, there will be moments yet where what we have been saying all along as believers will be shown to be right and true. And I think we're already entering into that period right now. I find it very interesting that in the world right now, there's a huge pushback against all of the ideologies that are happening, and not necessarily just from Christians, from non-Christians. They're pushing back and saying, this is getting out of hand. And in the meantime, we're kind of sitting there going, we already were talking about the dangers of divorce. We were already talking about for decades the danger of changing sexuality and making that normalized, changing gender ideologies and those kinds of things. We've already been talking about that for a long time. And it's starting to show the fruit of those things and what it's doing to our society. So God will bring forth your righteousness. So it is not in vain to live faithfully for the Lord. It will be a testimony one day of God and His goodness in your life. It will be a shame to the wicked. Let them mock you. Let them call you backwards for standing on God's word. It is to their shame one day. 1 Peter 3.17 rightly says it, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And as our psalm goes on to say about delighting in the Lord, verse 23, the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Verse 25, I have been young and now old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. Verse 39, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. All of those things describe what it means to delight in the Lord in these days. So as we look upon the prospering of the wicked in our day, fret not, delight yourself in the Lord. And finally, the last point from the psalm, wait patiently for the Lord. Verse 7 says it, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Christians are to practice patience. And we can be patient because we're told that the Lord is coming. Over and over again in scripture, the Lord is coming. And not just at the end of time, But even in our day now, he's coming to your situations in his timing. We may not see or understand the work that he's doing or why he waits to act, but we are assured that he will. And we are to be faithfully at work, delighting in him, waiting patiently for the Lord to turn that table around. This is applicable in so many places and so many ways. I'm first reminded this last week as I was listening to the great Martin Lloyd-Jones. He says that the church needs to be about the work of preaching the gospel. 
of knowing nothing except that of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then he says, even that message will fall on deaf ears if does not also come in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Ghost that makes the simple message of the cross and transforms it from this stumbling block and this foolishness to the perishing, to the most important and good news they will ever hear and transforms them. So we could preach all day the gospel, but if the Holy Ghost does not come and transform the heart and make it powerful for the person, they won't change. Because hearing is more than intellectual, it's spiritual in nature. If you have a person in your life who's staunchly rebellious against the Lord, there is something here for you to do. Be faithful in front of them. Speak the truth in love and wait patiently for the Lord to act. Be in prayer for them to move by the Holy Spirit in their heart. It's no different here as we find ourselves fretting over the wicked and their prosperity. But oh, what a terrible, difficult task it is to wait patiently for the Lord to deal with evil. 73 million abortions a year in this world. We're told to be patient. Wars and rumors of war, and people being bombed and people's homes being attacked. Innocent children facing shrapnel, and we're told to be patient. Children are being carved up to change their biological appearance, and we're told to be patient. Christian brothers and sisters are being persecuted all over the world, churches burned, pastors arrested. We're told to be patient. Now, of course, patient does not, patience does not mean inaction. As we said, we're to be in the service of doing good and in delighting in the Lord. That is an action, not a feeling only, but the truth of it is that unless the Lord acts, and this is the point, unless the Lord acts, evil will completely destroy everything. Sin will completely rule every person, including you and I, and until there is nothing left. The fact of the matter is this, God is the only one capable of, capable of doing anything about it. God is the only one with power to defeat evil. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, to rise from the dead in order to start breaking the chains of bondage to sin in us, to defeat the work of the devil, he says. His grace is at work each and every day. That's why the world's not worse than it is, because his general grace is at work in the world, to temper and to push back those dark things. God's the only one who's capable of defeating sin and death. He's the only one capable of defeating sin and Satan. And that is why we wait patiently for him. We wait patiently for the one who can truly change the leopard's spots, the one who can make a sinner a new creation, the one who can take our silly words and make them uh, meaningful to the dead heart. We wait patiently on the Lord, and as we work faithfully and delight in Him, we recognize that it is the power at work in us, His saints, that bring about His purposes. So that turns us into salt and light. That makes us a place where we're preservers of truth and doers of good. And so we wait patiently for God to judge, for God to save, for God to finally end all this and bring us home to where we really are headed as God's children, and that's the heavenly kingdom. And so there's something about you, you spend your days doing what's right, living for the Lord, being uh, faithful to Him, and you don't see necessarily the change you want. You don't necessarily see the world getting better. You don't necessarily see all the fruit that you want to see out of that. And there's something here that says be patient. Be patient and trust in the Lord. He's going to do something. He will work in His timing according to the way He chooses. And so, as God's, has God forsaken us in this land where the wicked prosper and the saints at times struggle? Certainly not. He says, fret not. Trust in me. Keep doing good. Keep fighting the good fight. Rather than fretting, delight yourself in the Lord and be patient because I will act in my appointed time. And one day, this wickedness that we see will be cut off. It will be decapitated and removed forever. I am not idle in the face of evil. I am coming. So that brings us great hope. It's a reminder of God's love. He knows that our eyes are open. He knows that our understanding is clear. While the world walks in this pattern, we see it so clearly and we're so troubled by it. 
He knows his children are concerned. He's not forsaken us. He's not forsaken this place. Be patient. He will act. As our psalm says in verse 34, wait for the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land and you will look on on when the wicked are cut off. I struggle a bit with that verse only because part of me, like I say, delights in the idea of looking on and seeing the wicked get cut off and another part of me is in great pain of the thought of it because I have family members who don't know Christ. I don't want them to be cut off. So as we come to the end, I remind us of David's words. As we look upon the wicked, we see them prosper whilst the saints struggle, we must find ourselves in a place where we do not fret, where we delight in the Lord, and where we wait patiently for Him. Such a well laid out passage for us. Do not fret, delight in the Lord, wait patiently for the Lord. I've been enjoying for about three weeks now this great old hymn, The Love of God. And I'm reminded here that as God's saints, we have been shown love from God that is incredible and unique in Christ. Not everyone in the world enjoys the love that God has shown us, for we were once counted among the wicked and as the wicked and are now saved by Christ. We have been called by name to a different life, called out from death to Christ, called out from slavery, and we're not what we once were, And we've been commissioned to call others to come and know him as we do and as Savior and as Lord. And this is the ultimate way to come against evil. If we want the world to change, it starts with the gospel, period. And so I end with these words from the song, the love of God, a reminder of the fact that as we look around at wickedness prospering, that he has not forsaken us, that his love is very present. The song says this, The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forever endure the saints and angels' song. When hoary time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who here refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure shall still endure, all measureless and strong, redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels' song. And this is the greatest verse. Could we with ink the oceans fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. He has not forsaken us. His love is enduring. Let's pray.